Welcome back to The Nation and welcome to the program this morning, Labor MP David Cunliffe. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, Roger. Firstly, I guess I'll get your reaction to uh, the Tribunal's recommendations overnight. What do you make of it that they've essentially said you have to consider the rights of Māori with fresh water? Well, I guess someone's sort of seen this coming, really. Uh, treaty rights go back a long way and one would have thought that in all the advice the government took for its asset sales program, treaty rights would have been high up there. Uh, this is a shambles of the government's making and now it's got a problem. Do you think still the government will proceed and float that first asset? Well, if I were in the government, uh, and I imagine they've got advice to this extent, they'd have to think very, very hard before they ignored the advice of the Waitangi Tribunal. Um, following that advice would at the very least require a further consultation process and that will delay the program. But I think this throws us back on a bigger issue. If you're a national government and you think the only way to economic salvation is mining national parks, tax cuts for rich people and flogging off assets, and one of those legs of the stools kicked away, it starts to make the rest of it look a bit thin. And I guess that's our broader discussion. OK, well, let's talk about um, Labor's uh, philosophy then. The traditional ph philosophy has always been summed up from, from each according to abilities to, to each according to needs. Mm, is that one. still relevant? I think it is, of course. Do you think Labor still follows that now? Yes, I do quite strongly feel that? Yes, I do. I think it's a guiding uh, philosophy for us. And uh, we, you know, what do we want? We want a society that's fair, that's equitable, where every Kiwi kid gets the chance to make the best of themselves and their lives and every family can blossom. We want a sustainable environment where we continue to be a place where smart people want to live. And we want a, a prosperous and productive economy that can, you know, deliver a good wage or a good salary to, to all Kiwi families. I want to raise uh, something that you said in your speech uh, in New Lynn, that famous speech now in New Lynn, that the government is there to protect people from the greed of business. Is that how you see the world, business versus people? No, I think that uh, business has a really important part to play and in the end this is going to be about all of us, all of New Zealand, including the business sector. But I guess what that speech was really about was looking back at recent history and, and particularly focusing on the global financial crisis and saying, you know, a lot of the old rules have been proven to be wrong. Unregulated free market capitalism uh, has failed the world. Uh, the great bust of 08, 09 has left us with a decade of debt to try and crawl out from under. And the housing bubble in New Zealand didn't help us. Those finance companies that went bust didn't help any of us. And so we have to have a relationship with business that's both a positive partnership and as government, we have to protect the public interest. And, and we have to look at how the world is changing and we have to adapt to that. So where do you draw the line with business? What behaviour is unacceptable? Oh, look, when markets work well, when there are plenty of buyers and plenty of sellers and, and, and markets are competitive, you generally let the market get on with it. Um, where there are, uh, as Robert Wade said, when there are imperfections that can be corrected, government has a responsibility to try and correct them. And sometimes, like in the global financial crisis, markets fail altogether and then governments, as they did with central banks, I have to stand behind the public interest. So that's, if you like, a market failure analysis. I think increasingly, and this is one of, for me, the lessons of the Scandinavian economies, there's an upside as well. Government, in partnership with business, can try to help bring buyers and sellers, producers and markets, local central government together and get quicker to a good outcome, help a new business start and grow faster, encourage innovation. So, so we are considered considering ways of getting to that upside mm, faster, okay. helping that as well. Give me three ideas then in the first term of uh, a Labor government that you would introduce that would guarantee, guarantee to trigger growth. Well, on, on we've already talked about in the macro side, pro-growth tax reform, a strong universal savings policy so there's more capital available for business, sustainable superannuation and a monetary policy framework that allows our exporters to enjoy a more stable and more competitive exchange rate. Those are important on the macro side. On the micro side, which is my day job now as mm -hmm. economic development spokesperson, uh, we want to make sure we are really driving innovation in partnership uh, with the business community, that we have a strong, vital, high-performance manufacturing sector, uh, that we have good, productive workplaces, and that we have lifelong learning to support that. So there's heaps of work going on in those areas. Uh, and we're excited about the opportunities. You're to make big it on green growth as well, too, sure. aren't you? Yep, absolutely. That, I find that intriguing because doesn't that 
move you away from the core Labour voter who, you know, mines, digs, drives, constructs. They're not green industries. Well, let's not have a false polarity here. Even Russell Norman's come on TV and said that they wouldn't abolish mining. And sure, Labour grew out of the mines of, of the West Coast and we're proud of that tra uh, tradition. But uh, we can't rely on mining, extraction, uh, or primary commodities to guarantee the kind of future that New Zealanders aspire to. We have to add value, we have to add smarts, we have to develop unique products and we have to strengthen our brand in the world. That is how we will be an innovative first world economy. Okay, what's the difference then between the green stance on mining and Labour's? Well, that will be a case-by-case -case analysis, won't it? Uh, and, uh, I mean, I think the Greens have a more black-and-white approach to... I think to they oppose option. all fossil fuel mines, don't they? Well, I'm not sure new, that Russell Norman has fossil. put it that way. I mean, I think they're moving, actually. He has. He has confirmed that he would oppose all new fossil fuel all mines. All new fossil yes. fuel mines. Well, that may well be the case. And uh, I don't think Labor would oppose a, a responsibly managed... Uh, high-value coal operation, but that would be a case-by-case -case analysis. It's my understanding that, that Labor's stance on mining isn't really that far from Nationals, really. Oh, I think that there would be some significant differences and nuance, but it would be a matter for the regulatory framework and a case-by-case -case analysis. OK, I want to bring you back to Scandinavia. You've sure. just come back from there. I have. What are they doing that we should be doing? Well, they are, first off, much more serious about innovation, and, and that's reflected in the level of investment. Uh, Denmark spends uh, about 2.5-3% of its GDP on R&D, Finland over 3%, uh, New Zealand barely 1%. Now, isn't it interesting that in the last two weeks uh, the government has come out and said they want to increase exports from 30% of GDP to 40 Great goal. We support the goal but almost no plans for how to get there. And in innovation, frankly, they're tinkering, and we need to go a whole lot further than they are. Where would Labor then find the money for R&D? Well, I mean, come from? we are going to manage within a careful uh, value for money fiscal parameter, but you've got to take a long-term view of investment and ensuring that your CRIs, your universities, uh, your R&D tax credits are in place and that you have the partnership structures that can bring innovators together with those who can commercialise that. Very, very important. How would you then, as we've seen from Stephen Joyce outlying uh, his plans to increase exports, how would you look to increase exports? Oh, well, I think we're talking about not only getting the macro settings right that we've talked about with tax and savings mm -hmm. and monetary policy, we're also talking about new partnerships with regions and sectors, particularly those high-value sectors that probably haven't enjoyed the, the currency swings that get reflected in our mm -hmm. dairy prices. Yes. Uh, the uh, innovative companies that are in our regions, helping them to navigate getting capital, getting the consents they need, uh, getting the partnerships they need to, to get into offshore markets, helping them into those markets, um, making sure that we have the skills, the training for our workplaces, making sure that we have a high value manufacturing strategy in place that will help develop that sector. Uh, those are all ideas that we're going to be bringing to the country and talking about more and more over the next few months. What the Scandinavians are particularly good at is adding value to their exports. They sure are. We're not. We are not. We are not. Denmark and New Zealand, classic case in point, have about $9,000 per capita exports from primary industry, from agriculture. But they have another 15,000 in manufacturers and we have about another 3,000. Yes. You know, that's the difference. But the issue here is that nothing's really changed since, you know, the end of the Second World War. Successive national and Labour governments have always said we need to add value to our exports. We're, exports, we're still exporting it's, it's a hard raw problem. wool yeah, it's a hard pine problem. logs yeah, and, and now milk powder and then re-importing it as a product. It's crazy. It is crazy. Why can't we add value then? Uh, because we haven't had a strong enough joined up manufacturing and innovation strategy at world standard. And look, the world is getting more global. We have to specialise. We have to get over the idea that we can just leave it 100% to the free market and try and do everything. We have to get together as a small country and say, what are we going to be best at the world at? And we're going to have to line up our resources around that. And we're going to have a, a new partnership between government and business to deliver it. Isn't the reality, though, that China will always be able to do it cheaper? Yeah. So why would we try to be a low-cost economy? That's nuts.
but we still need to add value to our exports. We do, and that's through brains, smarts, intellectual property, high skills, high value manufacturing.